Well, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm delighted to serve as the uh, opening act in this absolutely exciting and wonderful ISSM webinar on endometriosis. My name is Gerald Brock, and I'm the incoming president of the International Society of Sexual Medicine. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to uh, introduce this uh, whole topic today, uh, and I think that you're going to be uh, hearing some state-of-the-art information and very practical tips to how to manage endometriosis. Next slide, please. ISSM, of course, has been around now for several decades, and our vision is that every human being has the right to a healthy and satisfying sexual life. New slide, please. Our mission and our purpose is stated here. We've been around since uh, you know, the last 40 years, since 1982. And the whole idea is that we want to cover the whole field of human sexuality, male, female, transgender issues, and all of the evolving important topics as it pertains to sexual health. We wanna be the most respected and trusted source of information, education, and importantly, professional development. And it's in that spirit that these webinars have now been going on for the last two and a half years. As an example, we expect to have uh, several hundred people today, and there have been more than 400 registrants for this single webinar dealing with endometriosis. Next slide, please. The ISSM has uh, seven affiliated societies, and you can see that we're represented across the globe. Uh, all of these affiliate societies are active, involved, and serve the needs of the regions. And it's the role of the ISSM to integrate all of the activities that are happening worldwide and to provide a forum and a mechanism and a structure through which successful sexual education can occur to the patients, to for the physicians and healthcare providers across the globe. New slide, please. We do this through a series of different educational platforms. Uh, certainly virtual platforms like today's presentation have become incredibly important since COVID really changed the way we deliver medical and sexual education. But journals remain a very critical part to how we deliver that new and evolving information and educate healthcare professionals. We have a series of four different platforms in which we use. There's the Journal of Sexual Medicine, which has been the initial journal and represents state-of-the-art education, research, and basic science. There's a review article or review journal, Sexual Medicine Reviews, that has an impact factor just under five, which is incredibly high, among the highest in sexual medicine. We have open access journal, uh, Sexual Medicine Open Access. And then uh, for the surgeons largely, we have a video journal uh, that really shows technique and uh, procedures for sexual medicine issues. New slide. Today's webinar is going to be moderated by Padmini uh, Prashad. Uh, she's from Bangalore, India. Uh, she is a gynecologist, has extensive experience in the field, and has served on a number of different committees uh, in leadership roles. She is on the Education Committee of the International Society of Sexual Medicine. Uh, she also uh, has been on TV, radio uh, for public education related to sexual health. Uh, she tells me that as well, she is uh, a former secretary of the All India Gynecology Society. And I think you'll see from the way she moderates today's session, handles the questions and answers, that really it's a huge asset for us to have her, as well as a very exciting panel of speakers for today's program. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it along to Badmini to take it from here. And I look forward to hearing the rest of the presentations. Namaste to you all. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all, depending on the different uh, time zones. At the outset, I would like to profusely thank ISSM for the great opportunity to be a moderator for today's webinar. It is a pleasure to interact with you all and exchange ideas and share knowledge. This is the namaste from our uh, country. Next slide, please. In our culture, we always uh, light the lamp. It is an indication and first of all, it is a prayer and also a symbolic expression of moving from uh, darkness to light. Next slide, please. Today, we have discussion on a very enigmatic disease that is endometriosis and its impact on sexual health. 
for this we have two very renowned speakers uh, one from dr michel luria from israel who is speaking on endometriosis and sexual function and another uh, dr d hartman addressing the physical limitations of endometriosis that is the so that we can learn so much about how we can diagnose and what we can do to give relief to the patient because endometriosis is a serious illness which can affect women trans men and also non binary individuals and it is a very condition that is often misdiagnosed mistreated and as a result large number of women continue to live with unresolved pain that remains undiagnosed it as you all know the gynecologists especially medical people they know that it is a chronic inflammatory condition which is hormone dependent and also the presence of endometrial gland and tissue outside of the uterus so this endometriosis can have a significant effect on various aspects of women's lives their social sexual relation and also the work and study so this evidence suggests that the symptomatic endometriosis can affect all domains of female sexual function it can cause distress to the uh, woman her partner and also the couple i call upon dr michel luria to enlighten us uh, enlighten us on endometriosis and sexual health and uh, michel luria is a gynecologist and sex therapist she is president of the israeli society for sex therapy and immediate past president of the israeli society for sexual medicine she is the director of the center for sexual health at the hadassa mount scopus medical center and clinical director of the rotan center for multidisciplinary sex therapy in jerusalem israel she is a member of the executive committee of the european federation of sexology co chair of the european federation of sexology scientific committee over to dr michel for her uh, Uh, so thank you very much thank you thank you uh, padmini for your kind words for the introduction thank you issm for inviting me be, to be here today good morning everybody good afternoon uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today so let's get started so we'll i'll give a, a an introduction on endometriosis as So first of all we're talking about a very common condition it's in which the endometrium like tissue uh, it's found in other sites outside the uterus we're talking about between 5 and 10% of women of reproductive age but if we look into the population of women that deal with pelvic pain uh, pelvic pain so we're talking about between 50 and 80% of women and also it's about 50% of women who deals with infertility so it's quite common and there are three uh, presentations phenotypes it could be uh, superficial tissue or infiltrating uh, associated with also adenomyosis and of course we have little time to talk about a huge topic so I'll, i'm making this introduction very briefly without getting into much detail Uh, and we also uh, see women that the main expression or the only expression would be an ovarian endometrioma so called chocolate cyst so as padmini was saying we're talking about a systemic disease heterogeneous disease with inflammatory hormonal and immune components Uh, and the diagnosis today should be based mostly in the clinical picture in the interviews the history examination and imaging and not necessarily surgery what what in the past was the gold standard but today well in the past as well we don't need necessarily the surgery in order to diagnose and we are when we are saying not just a pelvic disease is because we know that there is a widespread inflammatory environment and we know of other expressions of of this uh, disease such as metabolic immune function uh, we know about neurological manifestations anxiety and depression fatigue 
central pain sensitization. And that's why we need to be very aware and try to diagnose as soon as possible, because usually these women uh, are in danger of being misdiagnosed or just missed for years until they get to the right diagnosis. And if we don't intervene early, the complications uh, develop. So, uh, so the main, one of my main messages for today is that we, again, we need to treat based on the clinical picture and not necessarily on the depth of the lesions. And also that we need to be aware and treat pain symptoms as soon as possible to avoid central sensitization. The management should be individualized and it could be different from country to country as pain perception and healthcare systems are different around the world. And medical treatment should be the first therapeutic option for these women. So again, I'm very, I'm being very brief. I uh, strongly recommend uh, if you're interested in this topic to read this uh, excellent review that was published in the Lancet not long ago. Uh, so the first line would be, as I said, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory uh, treatment just to treat the pain as soon as possible. And that would be together either with combined oral contraception or with progestin only. We have a, in a lot of places, Dino, Jest, Visabel, I don't know if that's available in all, in all the world, but countries that have Visabel may use uh, this proge progesterone in order to treat those women. And that would be the first line. Uh, also, the, the reason to use progesterone is because is, it inhibits endometrial pro proliferation and causes decidualization of the endometrium and is also an anti-inflammatory. The second line would be GnRH analogs with add back therapy or aromatase inhibitors with progestin or androgen analog such as danazol. The third line would be surgical excision and ablation of the tissue. And the fourth and last resource would be hysterectomy with or without BSO in case nothing else have helped. But the treatment is also not only about medication, which are all the things that I just mentioned may be effective in a high percentage of women, but sometimes it's not enough. And we also have to talk with those women and their partners and their families to give pain education, counseling, mind-body intervention, psychotherapy, because this, the suffering and the distress in the, these women can get uh, very uh, bad. Also, uh, as I said, treatment for chronic pain, uh, because as you will hear from D in a few minutes, pain is central in this uh, women's experience and it's not only about the pelvis. Uh, we could offer pelvic floor physiotherapy and of course we have to be aware as, as it was said that sexual problems are very, very common and we should actively uh, try to understand at what extent these women are dealing with sexual dysfunction and how, how can we help them. So what about sexual function? As we can understand, endomet endometriosis can impact all domains. So mainly we're talking about pain and in the literature, mainly about deep dyspareunia. But in the clinical practice, I see a lot of women that have pain, painful orgasm, even with masturbation or clitoral stimulation, not necessarily with, this, with a penetration. Some women will bleed each time they have an orgasm, um, slight uh, bleeding, mostly women with adenomyosis. And of course, if there is pain, there's uh, less satisfaction, that's, that's uh, understood. That's clear, 
they have little arousal and desire and that this is both because they are not having fun to say the least, but they're also the medication, GnRH analogs, contraception, all the, medica the, the treatments that I was just talking about could also affect sexual desire. And these women, instead of having motivation, they have hypervigilance, fear, and avoidance. So as we can see in this slide, the number of women, the percentage of women that haven't had any pain is almost zero. Eight, this is a uh, study that what was published two years ago, 5.8% have occasional pain, 14% often would have this perunia, but most uh, women will, will have either always or more than half of the, the time sexual pain. And this is a study that was done in 640 women. This is an adaptation of the fear avoidance model for the endometriosis patients. Sexual pain in these patients induces a fear avoidance reaction leading to arousal and or desire disorder. Uh, these women, as, I, as we said, they, they, it can take a long time until they get diagnosed. So they will report feeling that their symptoms were inappropriately normalized or minimalized, and they will suffer from dyspareunia together with fear, catastrophizing guilt. Uh, as I said before, some of them may have mood and anxiety disorders. If uh, partner's perception and social cultural context may exacerbate the distress if they have chronic pain. So that will increase the, the distress and could cause central uh, sensitization. On the other hand, next slide, please. And when those women get the correct diagnosis and the information that they need about what's going on, suddenly things make sense and they feel legitimacy for the complaints that, that, that they have been telling again and again. And they feel even empowered because it's not their imagination or because they're stressed or because they don't, are they are not good dealing with pain, but they have actually endometriosis. And this is the only way they can access the possibility to feel pleasure at any point. So I'll quote uh, Frida Kahlo. She said, I'll read it in Spanish, if there's any Spanish speaker in the audience. Soy del tipo de mujer que si quiero la luna me la bajo yo solita. I'm the type of a woman of women that if I want the moon, I'll bring it down all by myself. And by this, I want to honor a lot of women that I've seen in my practice that once they get the diagnosis, they, they begin actively to educate themselves and their fellows uh, in order to actively change their realities. It's very important we take on account that endometriosis is a common disease. By the end of the day, what we want is to help these women to have a tuned sexuality, which is an ideal state where an individual sexual self-concept and experiences are similar to the desired levels of sexual expression. And in order to live uh, a tuned sexuality, we need to honor and to have a good body image and to love and respect our bodies. We need women to have sexual agency and to able to be able to decide what they are willing to do and what they are not. To have access to sexual desires, to use protective strategies, and again, to act and uh, towards sexual pleasure, not only their a, a partner's pleasure, but also themselves. So it's a, this is taken from a book who talks about a, 
about eating disorders, but I find it very important and very uh, relevant for women and men that deal with chronic diseases, which are angry at their bodies and they have difficulty in the journey accepting and loving their body with all its limitation, respecting and listening to the body needs and protect their bodies from unrealistic social expectations. And these women feel a lot of stress trying to have intercourse because they're, this is what they're supposed to do, but intercourse could be for some of them very, very uh, painful. Next, please. So if we, I'll, I want, it's even funny to try to explain what is sex therapy in one slide, but in this specific uh, population and in all, I think in, in all populations, we are, first of all, we do a lot of psychoeducation, we give information, we have to be aware about mood disorders and anxiety disorders. We help these women deal with difficult feelings and thoughts related to their sexuality and their body in general. Uh, we need, of course, if there, those women are in a relationship to assess and include a partner if the woman is interested, we have, and we can help them out with facilitating communication and helping them finding new other ways to uh, experience pleasure. Uh, I think it's our obligation to advocate and explain about other uh, things that there are in the menu of sexual pleasure. Uh, we call it outer course, kissing, touching, caressing, and other things in that not only about uh, penetration. We have to give legit legitimacy to that. There is this device called ONUT, um, that it's a, a device that it's uh, worn externally by the penet penetrating partner at the base of the shaft. And this will act like a buffer and limit the depth of the penetration. It comes, there, these are four uh, rings, so the couple can, uh, can try and see what works better for them in case they would want to try penetration. And this is actually very helpful for people with deep dyspareunia. I think we also have to remind our patients, not only this population, but all our patients, this beautiful paper by, by Peggy Kleinplatz, uh, published a while ago, but I think it's relevant today and it will be forever. What are the major components of great sex and giving legitimacy uh, and advocating to be present, focused, embodied, to talk about uh, erotic and deep sexual intimacy, communication, empathy, authenticity, transparency, peace, healing, exploration, vulnerability. I like this especially, people that uh, being able to feel vulnerable in front of our partners, uh, it's a very big component of great sex. And the minor components based on this paper and in reality, because we see that these people is the intensity of the orgasm or the intensity of the desire. So of course those are very important, but we have to, again, to remind our patients that the picture is broader than just desire and lust. Next slide, please. Just to finish, I want to quote Viktor Frenkel that said, when we are not longer to change the situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. And again, I think that uh, patients with chronic diseases have this very difficult task. Uh, and not all, again, I think the COVID was a big te teacher of this philosophy that if we don't, if we are not able to change the situation, we have to change ourselves. So I thank you very much for your attention and uh, back to you, Padmini. Thank you very much. Yeah.
thank you very much, uh, Dr. Michel. That is for a very lucid uh, and informative uh, presentation. And thank you very much for that. But we'll let us take the questions at the end of the session after the other speaker also finishes his talk. Uh, sorry, her talk. Uh, next, we'll move on to the next talk, the pelvic floor physiotherapy for endometriosis by D. Hartman. Uh, I will request her to speak on the subject. The pelvic floor dysfunction is a common condition in women with endometriosis. And as you all know, this chronic inflammation, scarring and uh, pelvic pain and muscle spasm, all these things can have a very great effect on the uh, woman and her body and her posture and the pain and all these things, how we can address through the phys physiotherapy or physical therapy and uh, the pain centers. And we have a very experienced person to speak on that and give us uh, the important information how we can deal with endometriosis and give relief to the woman. Uh, Dr. D. Hartman, she is an internationally recognized educator, author, speaker on the treatment of chronic vulvar pain and sexual dysfunction. Uh, she and Elizabeth uh, Wood co-authored the Pleasure Prescription, a surprising approach to healing sexual pain in 2021. Together, they manage the Center for Genital Health and Education and Vulva Law. Uh, I invite D. Hartman to speak on the topic, pelvic floor physiotherapy for endometriosis. Over to you, Hartman. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Prasad. I'd also like to thank Drs. Graldi and Brock, as well as the ISSM Education Committee, for the true honor of being with you today to address this difficult, difficult conversation. I'd also like to extend a welcome and a big thank you to all of you who have given part of your Sunday to listen to our presentations. But before I get started, I always like to start with this disclaimer in any talks that I've been doing. This talk discusses chronic vulvar pain primarily, and you'll see how that evolves into the endometrial pain, while referring to those born with vulvas, ovaries, and uteruses. The terms women and or female will be used, and it's not done to offend or exclude anyone, but it truly is a representation of those who I treated in my practice. Um, I'm going to take a really broad approach. If you go back, please. I'm going to take a broad approach uh, today in talking about endometriosis. Those knowledgeable about the disease know of the insidiousness and the pervasiveness of the disease process. As Dr. Luria so stated, endometriosis isn't just a pelvic disease. Rather, we know it takes a huge toll on the entire body, mind, and function. I'm going to start with several slides that help demonstrate the overall disease process, not only of endometriosis, but many of the comorbid conditions that have been found along with it. To be clear, the papers that I'll report here are looking at women with chronic vulvar pain as a driving pain generator, but I think when we go along, you'll see that the message comes out fairly clearly. So the first slide really uh, looks at women with, with hypermobility problems. Uh, it was done in the US, um, again, diagnosed with dyspareunia. Next slide. There you see the common disorders that happen in this group, um, IBS, fibromyalgia, jaw dysfunction, migraine, bladder dysfunction, uh, lacerations, and on and on. Next slide, please. This is another study looking at vulvar pain um, diagnosed with either superficial dyspareunia, which I, I appreciate that endometriosis is mostly deep, but many, many of them also have superficial dyspareunia. Uh, next slide, please. And the common disorders that go along with that. Um, and you can see they're very similar, but this study was a little more uh, in depth, they obviously asked more questions, so we got more information there. Next slide, please. If you put them all together, though, what do you what do you see? I've circled the things: IBS, fibromyalgia, TMJ, cyst, endometriosis, headaches, dysmenorrhea, irritable bowel syndrome. What what general ideas do you get from that? Next slide. Yeah, pain. With endometriosis, we know that there's lesion-specific pain, 
However, we also know from the literature that removing the lesions doesn't always make a big difference. As many as 20 to 28% of patients don't experience any relief from pain following surgery. There's also, no, go back please. There's also evidence of function organ sensitization in the pelvic organs, seeing multiple combinations and toss it up between the bladder and the colon, the vagina and the colon, the bladder, the uterus, the uterus and the colon. So we know that any and all of the pelvic viscera can get involved in this insidious disease. Next, next, next slide. If you take a look at these circled items, pain lasting one to five years, anxiety and major depression, if you were to lump those together, might you come up with my next thought, next slide, trauma, you got it. Trauma is the result of the perfect storm that is created by chronic nociceptive pain from whatever organ is involved and time. Time doesn't only happen, trauma doesn't only happen after being on a battlefield or being physically abused or witnessing a murder, all of which we can refer to as big T traumas. There are also lots and lots of small T traumas, like losing a job, like divorce, like losing a parent, and we can add having chronic pain of any sort. Small T traumas come in all shapes, colors, and sizes, and we need to recognize them and address them appropriately. So when you think about it, whichever organ is responsible for the original pain, is that really the basic problem? We know that almost 30% of women who experience successful removal of intrametrial lesions are asymptomatic, are, are still symptomatic, excuse me. We also know from the literature that there's all sorts of viscerosomatic and visceral visceral convergences and crosstalk going on with these processes. It's all very complicated for sure. But how can we as physios and allied healthcare clinicians best help with this really amazing debilitating chronic pelvic pain condition. I think how we think about the process really makes a difference. Next slide. So this is a definition from the International Association for the Study of Pain on nociplastic pain. And that's pain that arises from altered nociception despite no clear evidence of actual or threatened tissue damage causing the activation of peripheral nociceptors or evidence for disease or lesion of the somatosensory system causing the pain. It may be added as the third mechanistic pain descriptor in addition to nociceptive and neuropathic pain. It was just suggested where I just came from that perhaps it can help describe a new vulvodynia construct. Next slide, please. Oh, no, I'm sorry, go back. I'm sorry, that was my, my, my fault, sorry. Um, I've just come from the ISSVD meeting in Dublin. It was a great time. Dr. David Foster discussed a, discussed a novel approach to a vulvodynia construct that incorporates an overlap of both nociceptic and nosoplastic mechanisms, rather than suggesting discrete categories of pain. He suggested that the two neurological hallmarks of neo of no sorry of nosoplastic pain are enhanced central sensitization, as well as altered motor activity causing myofascial pain. We know that nosoplastic pain is triggered by psychiatric trauma. Um, but that includes those small t traumas as well. Think about the pain caused not by being listened to or not being able to find help or just pain by itself. Those are all those small t traumas that need to be addressed. We know with endometriosis that there certainly are no susceptic pain generators, that sharp hyperalgesia and allodynia, but we also know that there are no soplastic changes. We see the overlap in pain, in depression, 
in sleep alterations and enhanced and expanded myofascial pain throughout the pelvis and the body. As a summary to all of that nosoplastic pain, they suggested it creates what he referred to as a fibromyalgia or fibromyalgia-like pain, that there's myofascial pain that happens throughout the body. Next slide, please. So this is just a diagrammatic to show you the comparison of traditional, this is based in the States, this is American ways of doing things, I'll give that caveat, that physicians take a broad look at all things involved in women's health and narrow the symptoms down to a single diagnosis because that's what we have to do here. Whereas I, as a physiotherapist, when I assess someone with pain in one organ or the other, I do my best to take a broad look at what possibly could be the cause of that pain. I take a step back and I look at everything from muscle, viscera, fascia, bones, joints, posture, gait. Because the chronic pain, with chronic pain, it's not just the pain that's happening. My job is to try to reproduce similar symptoms which then gives me a pathway to begin treatment. My overarching goal in the clinic was always to strategize with my patients to help them find tools to help themselves. That being said, I typically saw my patients on a weekly basis for one hour treatment sessions. Next slide, please. In 2017, I created a video to help me demonstrate what my amazing patients over the years in my clinic helped me learn. It does focus on localized nociceptive pain at the vulva. But remember that Dr. Foster suggested that the pain could also be referred to as nosoplastic pain, causing that fibromyalgia symptom of myofascial pain, all of which wrapped together leads to fear, hypervigilance, and upregulation of the central nervous system. As I said, I produced this slide, I produced this video in 2017, and I have often, I've shown it around the world, and a lot of people have seen it, and my question always is, why does this happen? Why is it that we can do these five exercises and see a change in that nociceptive pain at the vulva? Again, I've only done this at the vulva because that's where I, I, my specialization happened, but it would be my hypothesis that if I were to check and assess vulvar pain, or pardon me, urethral pain, or if I were to go up to the trigone and sex bladder pain, or to see what uterine mobility was, or even to see what rectal tension was, that I could use those as my nociceptive pain generators and do these same five exercises to see whether we could reduce the pain. And again, please know that these five exercises are what I use to, prior to each of my sessions with my patients by no means represents treatment because it's nothing about treatment. It's nothing that I'm doing. These are exercises that I have found helped my patients help themselves. Um, it's a, it actually gave me a great scale to monitor my progress of care as we went along because it was something that women, I could use each time to see how their pain continued to decrease. Next, next slide, please. This slide is a video. I'm sure it's uploading. It's going to take a minute. There it is. It's only six minutes long. Though pelvic floor muscle dysfunction appears to be a primary driver of chronic vulvar pain, it is possible that the muscular dysfunction is secondary to abnormal tension in the surrounding abdominal and pelvic viscera, fascia, and muscle. Together, these abnormal physical findings make internal assessment, whether digital or with the speculum, painful, difficult at best, or oftentimes impossible. This video will introduce five simple patient activities that can be used prior to intervaginal examination. Those activities include deep lateral diaphragmatic breathing, self-stretching of the lower abdominal wall, bilateral stretching of the deep hip muscles, active bridging, and active pelvic floor muscle mobilization. Three women with chronic vulvar pain, Kathy, Holly, and Lisa, were assessed prior to and following instruction and completion of these activities. 
Zero to ten. If zero is no pain, ten is the worst pain ever. What does this feel like? Give me a number. Like a six or seven. Six or seven. And this is right at the bottom. This is right at the posterior crochet. I'm going to turn my finger to the left, yeah. three o'clock, and give me a number there. Ten. Ten. And over here on the right. Nine ten. Nine ten. So not very good today. Using gentle digital palpation prior to those activities, each woman's vulvar pain was assessed at 3, 6, and 9 o'clock at the introitus. My assessing digit remained at the posterior fourchette throughout the completion of the activities, allowing me to reassess changes as they occurred. Now, I want you to put your hands on either side of your rib cage for me, low down, and I want you to put a little bit of pressure. And I want you to take a really deep breath for me. As you do that, I want you to push your rib cage out. Wonderful. I don't want your belly to go up. I don't want your chest to go up. When you get to the end, go ahead and breathe out. I want you to do this five or six times for me. And as you do that, your diaphragm goes down to pull the air in. And physiologically, as that happens, that's a transverse pressure down from the respiratory diaphragm all the way down to where my finger is. My finger's still where it was. I'm going to move it just a little bit. I'm still at that 6 o'clock spot. How does it feel now? Oh, Can you give me a number? Seven. How about here on the left side? Eight. Eight. How about here on the right side? Seven. Yeah. Now I want you to take your hands below your belly button, and I'm going to have you scoop in and pull up for me. And I want you to hold it there. There's a ligament on the back side of the abdominal wall that goes down behind the pubic bone and into the pelvis. And relax and let go. And I want you to do that again, and lift and pull. Clinically, what seems to happen is that bit of fascial pull releases tension all the way down through the bladder, through the urethra, and into the pelvic floor muscles. And relax. Let's go back to 6 o'clock. How does it feel there now? Give me a number. There's barely any pain. Barely any pain. How about here on the left? Two. And here on the right? Three. Okay. So now I'm going to have you stretch your hip muscles. I want you to bring this right knee and take it up to your left shoulder. Grab hold of it and give it a good stretch. There are five deep rotators that lie right adjacent to the pelvic floor muscles. I found clinically that a stretch of these muscles really help to relax pelvic floor muscle tension. So bring this knee up to the opposite shoulder and back down again. I'm at six o'clock again. Give me a number. Three. Three. How about here on the left? Four. And here on the right? Three or four. Three or four. Yeah. Okay. Now, I'm going to keep my finger here back at six o'clock again, and I want you to lift your hips up towards the ceiling. Go all the way up, and I want you to hold it for ten counts. This is an extensor activity, trunk extension, hip extension. All of those muscles tighten to hold. Oftentimes, the adductors will squeeze. Pelvic floor is such a follower. It goes along, and it holds tight, too. After ten seconds, you come down and relax all of those muscles. And now give me a number at six. Two. And at three. One. And at nine. Two. Good deal. Now we're going to do pelvic mobilization. I just want you to pull your pelvic floor muscles in like you're holding back gas and pee. Squeeze and hold for five. One, two, three, four, five. And let go all the way down. And then five quick ones. Two, three, four, five. And let go. Now, I'm back at 6 o'clock. How does it feel? No pain. Wonderful. How about here on the left side? None. And over here on the right side? None. Fantastic. And now give me a number at 6. 2. And at 3. 1. And at 9. 2. Back at 6 o'clock. How does it feel here now? 2. A 2. How about over here? 2. And over here? 2, 3. You feel like you have any more space down there? Yeah, it feels looser. It feels looser and more yeah. relaxed, less burning. Yeah. Wonderful. When assessing women with chronic vulvar pain, please consider using these strategies to decrease tissue tension, reduce anxiety, and lessen palpated vulvar pain prior to performing intervaginal examinations. Our internal assessment should not cause more pain. Rather, we should start by giving women hope that they are not crazy that this pain is not all in their heads, and that there may possibly be some very simple things that they can do to begin to help themselves regain control of their bodies. Thank you for your attention.
So come back. It's not letting me. There we go. So we have a lot of knots to untangle. Next slide. Before the black flowers can bloom. Next slide. Thank you for your time and attention. I look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Hartman, for that uh, such a wonderful uh, presentation. It was really nice to listen to and also watch the video. And it is extremely important, as you said, how the, it is a total body mind that we have to treat. I have seen many patients with excruciating pain and when they're uh, with each uh, menstruation or with each uh, intercourse when they're suffering from pain. And usually so many are branded as psychiatric patients and they had received uh, lots and lots of uh, anti-anxiety and the psychiatric medica medications. So, so many times it is uh, misdiagnosed, misunderstood, and some of them have come and uh, literally begged me to remove the uterus and give some relief in whatever way you want, because nobody will understand, my husband will not understand, and even if I tell the doctor, they say you have to relax, you have to take painkiller, and uh, this is like this, and uh, the pain is mostly in your head. So, all these things are quite common when you are really dealing with the uh, patients. So it is so very important when you have to give the overall relief to the woman because this can be a far-reaching effect. The endometriosis, especially with all the scarring and in the uh, pelvic floor, in the spaces between the uterus and the rectum and uh, the bladder. So those are the deep dyspareunia which are the causes for and can cause disturbance not only in the sexual function, in the bladder function and the uh, rectal function, bowel movements, and I have seen patients really suffering. And when it comes in the younger age and before uh, the fertility is uh, finished, then it is really a very difficult task uh, to treat them. And with your uh, physiotherapy and the pain, I, I think more and more uh, pain clinics should come up to give relief to these patients. And so it was such a wonderful thing. And uh, I hope all gy gynecologists uh, will... Uh, uh, make it a part of their treatment to treat the chronic pain so that we can give the overall relief, not only treating the endometriosis, but the symptoms, which are extremely important. And so now it is uh, time to move on uh, to questions and uh, answers. And there are a few questions in the question answer box. Uh, first question from an anonymous attendee. There are diabetic clinics all over the world, yet there are barely any endometriosis clinics. So many of us are just wasting away, trying to survive and not taken seriously. Endometriosis can be debilitating and comprise a dynamic disability, yet is not treated as such. If 10% of women experience this, how do we assess timely, proper treatment and support? How we do get the world doctors to take us seriously and help us? Any of you can uh, take it up. So this must be one patient who is really suffering and uh, probably who has not received the proper treatment or the proper relief. And with so much of dejection, probably uh, that person has sent this letter. Yes, yeah, I can. Yeah, I can, first of all, my heart goes with, with you. It sounds terrible. I can tell for our local story that in, in here in Israel, two ladies with uh, endometriosis that they, it took a long time until they were diagnosed and a lot of consultations until they understood. They did the Frida Kahlo's maneuver and they took uh, the power in her hands, they created allies yes. with, uh, and I think this is the way to go. Look for allies within the uh, healthcare providers community. There are a lot of people who doesn't know and are not willing to help, but there are a lot of people who are both uh, conscious and willing to help. So that's what happened here. Like they found a few uh, uh, physicians, physiotherapists that are into helping 
sex therapists, and they today they have uh, association with with conferences, yearly conferences. They change the law in a way that women with endometriosis can get money from the government if they are in sick leave. Like it began, don't give up. Look for allies, and you should find allies in your. I don't know where, whenever you are, wherever you are, but yeah, because uh, but now with the easy access to the net, and I think um, so all these societies uh, must get this uh, contact numbers or how they can approach, like uh, Hartman, and when people are there all over the world in their own places, whoever who is there. If we can have some uh, clinics, which uh, the numbers which we can give, so that any place, anywhere they can contact any person, even abroad, and even the video calls and all these things they can make use of now with advanced insect technology. And they need attention, they need relief. And we should not just brush it aside as a psychiatric problem or it is not so serious or trivializing the thing. That should not happen for any of these patients. And next question for uh, uh, the question for Mijal Luria Can endometriosis be treated by shockwave therapy? So I've seen a few, I think there's one or two groups doing a, a bit of uh, research on that, but I don't think we have today good literature on that. Maybe in a few years we'll get more information, but yes. yeah. as for today, we don't know much about it. Yes. Uh, does deep dyspareunia indicate the severity of endometriosis? So, so should I answer this? Yes, as yeah. a gynecologist, you can. Okay. So, uh, classically, deep dyspareunia is it's related to deep lesions in the uterosacral ligaments or the pouch of Douglas, but not. I think that we should. It it could be related. That's for sure. Yes. And the rectum lesions in the rectum, but not only. I think that in both ways, like women without deep dyspareunia, that doesn't rule out yeah. uh, disease. And on the other hand, women with pain, it doesn't necessarily mean. Yeah, so, but uh, yes. Right. And, and no, I, symptom I, is severe. Yes, Hartman, how you can uh, deal with uh, yeah. deep well, I was just going to, to add to that too, that the deep dyspareunia from a functional physical perspective is that a uterus that doesn't move, right? If, if, if with normal sexual intercourse, with penile intercourse, the, the uterus is very mobile on the broad ligaments. If with endometrial disease, if, if with any type of adhesions, it doesn't have to even be with endometriosis. When, the, when the, the, that deep penetration happens, it puts pain and pressure on the uterus, which pulls, which creates pain. Oftentimes you can change, change the position and not go straight into, up into this cul-de-sac or into the cervix, but to go more posterior um, intercourse doggy style, for instance, where the, where the penis goes more down posterior towards the rectum, that sometimes can help. Um, but deep dyspareunia is, is another one of those multifactorial things that we just deal as physical therapists, we deal from a functional perspective, but it doesn't change the disease process by any means. But we right. that's we try to really just kind of calm the central nervous system down, calm down the visceral system and do what it can do. Yeah, like uh, painkillers, change of postures and all these simple measures, if it doesn't help avoiding deeper penetration. So maybe surgical uh, interventions, uh, they may need a laparoscopy or uh, release the additions or whatever that is there in the deep pouch of Douglas, uh, that might help them. But uh, sometimes the symptoms are so severe and the inside when you see the endometriosis is, uh, we have very few deposits of endometriosis. But sometimes a serious disease, very big uh, chocolate cysts and the symptoms may not be so much. So many times uh, the symptoms and the severity do not uh, match. So as gynecologists, they all uh, know how it is. So another uh, question to D. Hartman. Uh, what should a woman uh, with endometriosis do if she can't afford weekly pelvic floor physical therapy? It is so difficult to do the internal releases manually by myself. So I avoid doing it consistently, which isn't helping. Yes, and I hear you. 
and and my heart goes out to you around the world. It goes out to you, not only for money issues, but for availability, for finding people who have experience enough to do what you do, which is one of the reasons that I did create the video. That's something that at least gives you a, can give you a start to help you decrease your fear, decrease your tension, decrease some of that those associated tensions in and around the pelvis. Uh, there are books, I, we just published a book on decreasing and healing healing sexual pain. Um, just stay honest, stay open, stay focused and, and look towards what you can do in your life to make pleasure happen. Um, it doesn't get rid of what's going on, but it helps us to overcome it a little bit easier. Um, there's no easy answer. I wish I had an easy answer. Um, I wish I could treat everybody. We, you know, we we're limited by that. Um, but don't give up. Uh, you know, as, as 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 you've heard before, just don't give up. There's help. Somehow there's help. So just. I are you using any other uh, painkillers during your sessions or um, uh, hot fermentations or uh, giving some uh, warm baths and things like that? Um, no, I don't find I need to because if, if, if I did that, I would be getting rid of what I need to know what I'm doing is if what I'm doing is changing. And again, I'm working on strategies to help women help themselves. If I were to use any kind of drugs, lidocaine, or if I were to use other things, then I wouldn't know that what we were doing from a functional perspective would be making that much difference. I have a, I don't have a problem with women doing that by any means on their own. I just don't use that as didn't use it as a part of my practice. How long they take uh, the, how many sessions usually they take when you really remodel, realign and things, the body posture, the pain, and uh, these are all, this is a big vicious circle, like with it, the pelvic it, floor it, dysfunction. Yes, it's that, it certainly is, as most chronic pain syndromes are, um, and we work and do our best. I think that, that, that the, again, the, the atrocities of COVID have brought us um, virtual counseling and virtual treatments, and I think that that hopefully will be something in the future that we can get to more and more people and help again strategize to help women help themselves yeah. uh, another, uh, hello thank you for your presentation is there uh, clear evidence that a history of adverse childhood events make endometriosis more likely or more painful do you want to answer that you want me to answer that yeah you anybody um, the I, there was just a systematic review that was published, and I think that endometriosis, they, they found instance, an increased instance of endometriosis and vulvodynia, but they weren't statistically significant compared to the controls, and they suggested that that was possibly because so few of people are diagnosed with those disorders, as we know, um, and if they're not diagnosed and it's not coming up, then it's not going to show up in the research, but from my own clinical perspective, I think it's a huge impact. I think it makes a huge impact. For those who don't know, it's a very simple 10-question questionnaire that looks at what happened in the home um, in the early stages of life and how that can impact the it's, rest of your life. Especially the child sexual abuse, and those people already, they have a psychologically deep-seated trauma. I think right. that can exaggerate the pain if they have this endometriosis. That may be the problem. Uh, for the child, child, childhood adverse events also predisposes for any uh, central pain uh, uh, disease. Like it's, we know that it's a uh, risk factor for pain. The, pain diseases, all of them, fibromyalgia. So I, I don't know if it produces endometriosis, but the, by the, it doesn't help the nervous system deal, dealing with the pain, that's for sure. Yeah, it also increases the risks of, of alcohol, alcohol abuse, obesity, crime. All, I mean, the list is miles long. Yeah, the most of some of this uh, with uh, child sexual abuse, they may be suffering from vaginismus also. I have seen quite a few cases. One of the reasons for vaginismus is, uh, so again, we have to deal with the vaginismus and also dyspareunia and all these things, adverse events and the psychological. They need a little more of a psychiatric counseling also. Yeah. Uh, for how long the relieving effect works after this physical therapy? It's a, it's a gradual process. 
Um, again, I use the tool to monitor that and I have them use those exercise, use those five exercises twice a day um, to help with their life ongoing before they can use, then use it before they have a gynae exam. They can use it before they insert a tampon. They can use it before they insert a sex toy. Um, it's a process and everyone is different. Um, and I, I wish I, I did two surveys and one suggested 11 to 13 visits. The other said nine to 12 visits worldwide. So, you know, I can't give a specific time. I don't, I did, everybody is different. Everyone is different. Everybody responds different. Uh, again, a question for you. Can you repeat the five exercises? I can, and if anyone is interested, you can actually find the video on YouTube. Um, it's free access. You can go and find it. If anybody is interested, I also have a sheet of instructions uh, for patients to do it, but they're uh, deep lateral diaphragmatic breathing, stretching of the uracus of the lower abdomen, stretching of the hips, active bridging, and active pelvic floor muscle exercises. Okay, thank you. Uh, what practical advices uh, can we give to sexual partner of a patient suffering from endometriosis? Mm. Well, I don't know. I think that mostly couples have to communicate. I don't know if I have one simple answer to communicate. These couples suffer a lot. Both, both persons, the, the person with the endometriosis and, and her partner. So communicating, trying to do as much as possible the things that cause pleasure and avoiding and don't, don't do things that cause pain. Those women usually feel a lot of pressure, even if the partner is not pressuring, they feel internal pressure. They want to be that good woman that can make everything. And usually it's a lot of, that brings a lot of frustration. So I don't have a simple answer. Yes. That try to focus. There are so many things, touching, bathing, a genital touching, a gentle, I don't know. There's a big, big menu of things that can be tried, but do not do anything that cause pain. Yeah. Yes. One thing yeah. we have to keep in mind as soon as an endometriosis is diagnosed, it is very important to counsel the couple, call the husband and explain about the disease and uh, how they can go about it depending on the symptoms they have and how he can help her and uh, even with the other sexual activities and how they can manage the pain if, it, if there is a pain. So giving a lot of moral support to her and love her and give affection and the relation, improve her relationship. So that becomes uh, more important for the husband and he also feels that he has got some information how he can go about it, how he can help his wife to keep her happy and how they can change certain things during the sexual activities. So right. that becomes the counseling of the husband becomes very important. Plus uh, the communication, communication, communication. Correct. Um, is finding things outside of intimacy that they have pleasure doing together. Yes. So that they can do things and enjoy things outside before they come into this hard spot of intimacy. Uh, I am not suggesting endometriosis is purely caused by psychological trauma, <laughs> the one uh, uh, given that earlier. Yes, endometriosis cannot be caused by psychological trauma alone. There has to be some predisposition. It can only exaggerate the symptoms. That's all what we are uh, saying. Uh, again, for Dee Hartman, thank you for this great presentation. Are there any training videos uh, you, you can uh, recommend for patient and healthcare providers? You would recommend any of these, whether it is available for free or not. It, and again, it's on YouTube. Um, you can find it there. Um, I do teach courses for physiotherapists. Um, would love to start doing courses for, for, for the public and those with pain, but we haven't quite gotten there. Um, it's... It's a, it's a big job and I've been working on it for a long time, but that's, you know, the book again, try the, try, try our book, the pleasure prescription, a surprising approach to healing sexual pain. I think it's a good way to. Yeah. To Somebody has asked what I can, what can I do as psychosexual therapist to help clients with the dyspareunia when PT therapists are not existent in the city where we are at. Can I get trained to do some of the exercises or can this be done online for them? 
the exercises can anybody can do the exercise the exercises can be done by somebody who's pregnant in throughout the life cycle it doesn't have to be just with vulvar pain you know if throughout the life cycle with pain for sex it, it's perimenopause menopause kid young kids whenever it can help to downregulate and improve things would it be possible to develop worldwide guidelines yeah, ISSM can do do a lot, I think, in this field and give the proper guidelines with uh, experienced people like you all. I think uh, uh, we can do something to give guidelines, a proper guidelines. Yeah, in the said, meanwhile, I recommend, I highly recommend this paper in the Lancet from a year ago or this excellent review. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the pelvic relaxation exercises in the video should be a part of every gynec exam, as so many women have pain on examination. Thank you. Somebody else is to give a compliment. Yoga is helpful for pelvic pain. What type of yoga do we uh, do you recommend? Uh, what time? Of, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. What time? Yoga, of yoga uh, as you all know, yoga. Hmm. Any kind of yoga that you can find that you can do on a regular basis, it doesn't really matter to me. Anytime you can move and get your body moving and relaxed and into that is, yeah. is wonderful. Actual exercises, exercise, exercise. We know that exercises decreases inflammation. So regular exercise is also very important. Yeah. Yoga Maybe. is helpful for both for the body and the mind and the mind, the relaxation and the muscle movements, joint movements. So certainly yes. it is going to help. Yes. Uh, when to choose between going to a physical therapist uh, versus psychosexual therapist? <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm a truly believer in multidisciplinary clinics. And if people have the time, the, the, the strength, the resources to do both is great. To work both uh, top down and bottom up, uh, to work with the body and and... Uh, with the feelings and, and thoughts around this issue, that would be the best. But if people can access only one, so the woman is the one who should, who should decide. Choose. Yeah. What would it, be it, yeah. It's not uncommon that I would get referrals from psychologists or I would send my patients to psychologists because we know with any of these, it's so complex. There's so much going on that, that that it all needs to be addressed and from different perspectives. I think it's yeah. that only so not necessarily a psychiatric disease, but definitely there will be psychological disturbances, anxiety, depression, and all that. That should be addressed by any psychosexual therapy or uh, during psychotherapy. That's what somebody has asked. Uh, you have not mentioned an important ingredient in the treatment that is psychotherapy. We human beings should learn to take care of ourselves in life. But in my exemption, women with endometriosis are women that are perfect. Everything they do, professional, personal, and every aspects in their life, they do well. Don't recognize their limits. So in therapy, it is an important issue to deal. Yeah, somebody who must be supportive. Totally agree. Uh, Mr. President, can we take some more questions? Uh, how much time we have for another few questions are there? Yeah, I think that, you know, my suggestion, I think that you've done a great job in terms of moderating and the presentations were wonderful. Why don't we give each of the speakers maybe a minute each to summarize the key take home messages from their presentations and based on the questions that we got as well. Now they have a feeling for the audience and then we'll, uh, we'll sum up the presentation because we're almost out of the racetrack now. Yeah, the audience have been very interactive and uh, they eager, they're they eager to know things and they're appreciating the presentations. And really, it is so nice and it is really an informative webinar, I can say. Uh, so thank you for your presentations. If uh, combined oral contraceptive pills are used as treatment for endometriosis, what do you recommend about this stall or placebo week, stop or placebo week? Can the pill be taken without stopping in this case? So when you are using OCP, are you giving one week stop in between or where you are continuously using Continuous. it? Continuous. 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 Okay. Thank you, everybody. So, so thank you a lot for your interactions and it was really nice to hear, nice to know uh, new things and how we can uh, in, uh, keep 
all those uh, information when we deal with the patients and uh, from both the talks and uh, what exactly is the endometriosis and how it can affect how it can affect uh, so many of the functions of the body inside the pelvis in the abdomen and overall uh, effect on the body and mind so it can affect the, most of the organs especially because of this chronic inflammation and the scarring and the muscle dysfunction the muscle can cannot stretch properly or it can get shortened so that's how the pelvic floor dysfunction starts and the physical therapy and the pain relief is definitely go, going to have a long term effect on the patients and as gynecologists when the diagnosis and each patient has to be individualized depending on the symptom whether they need the medical treatment or the surgical treatment and when it comes to sexual function because most of the gynecologists do not address the sexual function aspect because they don't make it a part of their history taking or the diagnosis and the impact on the relationship and the partner and the husband but it is a very important thing i am really so happy that issm kept a session of endometriosis and sexual dysfunction and i am sure many will go home with a very good take home messages and the importance of dealing with the sexual function and the relationship and then looking at the partner and in any, any case of endometriosis uh, thank you very much uh, for the great session and over to Wonderful. Well, again, thank you to both speakers and to the moderators, um, and certainly to the audience for all of the wonderful questions in the interactive session. Uh, you know, this will be available shortly that you can revisit it on the ISSM University. And I'd like to invite everybody to the next webinar, which is going to take place in roughly four weeks, looking at the sexual medicine practice in Latin America, situation and challenges. That's going to be organized jointly with the International Society and with the, uh, the uh, SLAMS, the Latin American uh, affiliate of ISSM. It will be done in Spanish, but there will be simultaneous translation in English and Portuguese. So with that, we'll call this session to an end. I wish you all a very good end of your weekend and uh, health and safe uh, next week and in the future and look forward to seeing you all in the near future whether it's virtually on our next webinar or hopefully in person at the meeting that'll happen in October in Miami. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a good rest of the weekend. Thank you all. Thank you.